You may be seated. Lorraine J. Larson, 91 of Wilmer, died Sunday, March 6th at the Bethesda Heritage in Wilmer, Minnesota. Her funeral service is today at 11 o'clock and uh, there will be a lunch uh, following uh, this, uh, this funeral. Lorraine was born to Carl and Theolina Rigstead Johnson on August 22, 1924 in Arctander Township. She lived in Sunberg during her childhood years later moving to Kirkhoven, where she attended high school. On September 5, 1942, Lorraine married Vernon Larson in Tacoma, Washington, where he was stationed in the Army. They lived in Tacoma briefly before transferring to Fort Smith, Arkansas. They moved to Pennock after Vernon's discharge and eventually made their home in Wilmer. Lorraine was a homemaker and raised six children who kept her very busy. She had a cool wit and a sharp sense of humor, loved to bake and cook, and served the best roast beef and gravy anywhere. It must have been a family member who uh, had that inserted. I, I, I heard about her roast beef. Uh, she was musically inclined, played the piano, and loved to listen to music. The last several years of life, Lorraine enjoyed her almost daily ritual of watching the Wheel of Fortune, attempting to solve the puzzles before the contestants. She will be remembered as a devoted and loving mother, spiritual, sweet, humble, a good friend, and will be missed by all who knew her. Lorraine is survived by her children, Marcia, and her husband, Glenn Hovey of Atwater, uh, Dwayne, and his wife, Linda Larson of 50 Lakes, Melanie and her husband, Brad Benson of Dawson, and Valerie and her husband, Randy Anderson of Lakeville, and Vanla Larson of Lando Lakes, Florida. 13 grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren, and one is on the way. Must not be here, huh? Okay. She is also survived by her brother, Curtis Johnson of Sunberg, sisters-in-law Rosalie Johnson of Wilmer, and Elaine Ansescu of Asinaboya, did I say that right? Okay, Saskatchewan, and a brother-in-law, Herb Larson, also of Saskatchewan. She was preceded in death by her parents, four brothers and three sisters, her husband Vernon, her son Tim, and a grandson, Jim Hobie. Amazing. 
Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. My name is Jeff Sandquist and I am the husband of one of Lorraine's granddaughters, Laura. And while it was her intention to be here today and give this herself, unfortunately, she's feeling quite a bit under the weather and so she's not able to be here. So she and the family have asked me to read what she wrote based on the contributions of all of them in remembrance of Lorraine. And honestly, the truth is, is that all the uh, Norwegians were too shy to get up here, so they sent the loudmouth Swede in their place. <laughs> so while in a perfect world, Laura would be up here reading this morning, uh, I think we all realize and know that we don't live in a perfect world, and so we just have to do the best that we can with the situation at hand. And I think in this instance, Grandma Lorraine would be okay with me standing in, because one of the last times that I saw her, which was on Christmas, I went up to say hi to her and Merry Christmas, and she looked at me and she said, I don't know you, but you can stay. <laughs> so obviously she was having a bit of trouble with her memory towards the end, but her spirit and sense of humor, uh, which we got to see more and more as she aged, uh, were definitely there as well as her, her love for people. They remained intact the entire time. So this is the last thing that I will say before I share with you the words of, of Laura and the rest of the family. While some of you may think that I look young, this isn't my first eulogy I've given, nor is it my first funeral service. I'm actually quite familiar with losing those close to me, including my own father when I was a child. The reason I say this is because I just wanted to give you permission to give yourself permission to laugh, to smile, to celebrate, and to share a story about Lorraine and others today uh, in this and uh, in the future. Just as much as it's okay for us to cry and be sad and mourn a loss, it's okay for us to do all of these things. So it is my belief that Lorraine lives on and is truly in a better place, smiling down on all of us today. But I also believe that a person only truly dies when we stop talking about them, when we stop remembering them. It has always been my belief since I was a child to always remember those we love and to never forget. So that said, here are the words of my wife, Laura, and the rest of the family. On behalf of the family of Lorraine Larson, we would like to thank everyone for being here today to celebrate the life of Lorraine. I am one of Lorraine's 14 grandchildren, daughter of Valerie, one of her six children. She also has nine great-grandchildren and another one on the way, as we've already discovered. That's 25, actually 29 lives made possible uh, by one woman, not to mention all those in the future. I asked my family and cousins to share some of their memories of Grandma Lorraine, and three themes emerged as we reflected on her 91 years on Earth. And just so we're clear, uh, if she were here today, she would be sure to remind you that she's actually 91 and a half, and that she would turn 92 in, 92 in August. So the first thing, theme is everything about Grandma's house on 4th Street in Wilmer. We spent a lot of time there together growing up, and what made it Grandma's house was Grandma. From her amazing cooking and baking, especially the Sunday afternoon special, it's already been mentioned, roast beef and gravy, and her immaculate housekeeping skills. There was always something about being at Grandma's house that made you feel cared for, cared for and safe. The never empty candy dish with Werther's original in the living room, the color themed bedrooms, red, yellow, and blue, that each family would pick a room to stay in for the weekend, playing in the basement that was also neat and orderly, just like the rest of the house, making forts out of large, large cardboard boxes, the awful sounding exhaust fan in the kitchen with the weird chain that she would let us pull. I don't know why we love that so much or even remember it, I can't tell you that. Breakfast laid out in the morning that included orange juice with the hair in it, also known as pulp. <laughs> Spinning in the kitchen chairs, which is one thing you didn't want to do listening to records and running around the living room, playing the piano and finding all the cool stuff in storage, and of course, walking down to the gas station to get free popcorn, which, as far as I know, you can still do today. And then in the later years, teaching Grandma about new technology, she was always interested in learning and actually had her own laptop where she played solitaire and typed. Not sure what she typed, but she typed. She was introduced to smartphones, taking selfies, and she also learned to use the self-checkout at the grocery store. She was proud of being the oldest at all of our weddings, watching Real of Fortune every night, and visiting over coffee in her homey condo. 
These memories of being at Grandma's are ingrained in all our memories and are so comforting and special to all of us. The second theme of Grandma's life was that she was humble and sweet. She was definitely a good Norwegian. She once said that her goal in life was to be nice to people. We think she accomplished that goal. She often had visitors dropping into her house and people always said she was easy to talk to. Some have even said she was like a surrogate mother to them. This sweetness about her probably came from her ability to sense the feelings and needs of others around her. And I should also mention here that part of her sweetness may have been all the cookies and ice cream she was eating in these past few years, but we'd always remind her that since she was over 85, she could do whatever she wanted, and she definitely owned that. And as part of being a good Norwegian and also being so sweet, she never wanted to draw attention to herself and was always incredibly humble. We all loved Grandma's lefse, and every single time she made it, she would tell us everything that was wrong with it and how it didn't turn out. But it always turned out, and the plate would be gone in an instant, especially the ones with butter and sugar on it. Her lefse was the best in the world, but she would never admit to you that. She was also a very talented piano player and actually played by ear. We always begged her to play for us. This went on for several years, and she'd always say in her Sunberg, Minnesota accent, oh, I haven't played in 30 years. I'm not very good. Well, finally she played for all at Thanksgiving recently, and of course she reminded us that she was not very good, but when she sat down at the piano and proceeded to play several songs perfectly, we realized differently. We've also heard the rumor that she loved to dance, especially the waltz and the foxtrot, but we never were able to convince her to show us those moves. I'm sure she's doing some of those up in heaven right now. And the third theme of Grandma's life, and, and our most favorite thing about Grandma, was her witty sense of humor. It was always such a shock coming from such a sweet and humble person. And the best thing about her sense of humor is that, is that it, uh, she allowed more of it to come out with her age. Now many of us know uh, where we get that classic Larson humor from. If she was here right now, she'd definitely not like that we were making a big fuss over her. She'd probably just laugh like she always did when we teased her and say, Oh, you rascals. Even though we miss her greatly, we are at peace. Grandma was ready. With her strong faith, she had no fear in death. <clears throat> Toward the end, she said with a laugh, Well, if I don't get better, I guess I'll just kick the bucket. <laughs> she was happy with her long life. Now she is no longer in physical discomfort and she is reunited with her husband Vernon after 27 years without him. She never stopped talking about how handsome he was and how he how, how he loved to listen, how she loved to listen to his music. She is also reunited with those who have gone before her including those who went too soon, her son Tim and grandson Jim, as well as her parents, four brothers and three sisters. Um, we know she won't be disappointed with her reunion in heaven and she will be remembered as a devoted and loving mother, spiritual, sweet, humble, and a good friend. I'd like, you, I'd like to leave you with one of Grandma's classic lines that she would have used when we would leave her house after a visit, and this is actually the last thing I said to her one week before she passed. Goodbye, Grandma. See you in the funnies. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus.
This day is fragile Soon it will end And once it has vanished It will not come again So let us love With a love pure and strong Before This day is fleeting when it slips away. Not all our money can buy back this day. So let us pray that we might be a friend before. This day is frail, it will pass by, so before it's too late to recapture It's a nice picture, isn't it? The, uh, I only knew Lorraine the last several years of her life. Many of you have known her all your life, and uh, the stories and the testimonies have only confirmed what I saw in her. She was, how, how, how can I, witty, but very kind. She went with the flow, and I would agree that if, she would be a little uncomfortable if she saw everybody making a fuss over her. And so, uh, Lorraine, your family did make a fuss over you today, and uh, they put all this together to remember their mother. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's encouraging to see a family that has good memories and uh, don't want to uh, forget those. As we think of uh, Lorraine and the, it wasn't always easy as World War II and she got married and her husband was in Europe, came back, and uh, in fact her brother was telling me that uh, uh, how long did the train ride take from Arkansas to, to Pennock, is that where it ended up? Okay, it's uh, that had to, I don't think they had air conditioning, did they? Pro probably a steam engine. Stopped at every town along the way. 
and uh, uh, I don't know, days, huh, on a train. Were you with her? Okay, Marsha, you don't remember that. Okay, your, your mom does, I'm sure. And uh, as the family was putting this together, one of the things that they found was uh, some notes from their brother, Tim. And those notes verified that he knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. And as you stop and you think about that, and this is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a little, we have a little family get-together right here. Well, there's a little family get-together in heaven right now. And uh, mom and dad and Tim, their grandchildren, who have gone on before, are in heaven. And I don't know, I don't think they can see us today, but uh, if any of you go, you can tell her that uh, we had a, we tried to have a nice funeral for her. So Lorraine is a, uh, a in interesting uh, person, and I certainly enjoyed uh, uh, meeting her. And as we think of this, I'd like to uh, look at a few passages of scripture and I've never done this before at a funeral, but I'm going to do it right now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I, it, we read this in verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that we sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. As we sit here this morning and we consider not only Lorraine's life but her death and where she is right now, in our country, the Word of God, the Bible, which explains to us what happens at death, what happens after death, is being ignored, being pushed aside, and a lot of people today don't know what happens when a person dies physically. So I put together some, some uh, pictures here, and I'm... Uh, Lorraine, she liked purple. I put here a, uh, a picture here and just want to explain and take a look. Now, this is not what you would typically see at a funeral service. This is a lesson. So bear with me. And children, watch. A picture can be worth a thousand words. And here we have a human being that was created in God's image a spirit, a soul, and a body. And the spirit is, gives a person the ability to communicate with God. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve had in the garden. But something happened. Sin entered into the world. And as we stop and we think of what sin did, sin broke that communication link. And Adam and Eve hid from God, and they died spiritually. And they no longer had a capacity. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are all born dead in trespasses and sins. You might ask, well, how could a person be, be born alive and be dead at the same time? And the answer to that question is this, is that we are born with no capacity to communicate with our Creator at all. We are separated from God. And so God in His love and His grace and His mercy, understanding fully the consequences of this death, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die. Because the Bible tells us that the wages the consequences of sin is death. And if we had to 
pay our own consequences, it would take us forever, all of eternity, to pay for our own sin. The fact is, we need help. And we need a substitute. And God in his love sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to be that substitute. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. He didn't die on the cross just so we could have a, a Easter holiday. He died on the cross because we need a substitute. And a holy God demands that sin be paid for. And the only payment that will satisfy God is death. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there, has, there is no forgiveness of sin. And we need our sins forgiven. And so, here's a picture. And as we stop and we think of a person, and this verse that we just read said this, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and what happens is this, is that that spirit that was dead is made alive. We sometimes refer to that as the new birth, the regeneration. And the Holy Spirit comes in and seals us. Now as we stop and we think of, of the results of that, the result is this, is that through Christ, we can have communion, we can have fellowship, we can communicate with God. But because the Bible also tells us, and it's very evident, that our bodies groan. In fact, they're waiting. And if you, if you are not groaning and you don't feel aches and pains this morning, it's because you're numb or you're very young. And I think you could all agree that as you get older, and this is true with Lorraine. The older she got, the more aches and pains she felt until finally her body couldn't hold out anymore. And as we stop and we think, well, what happens to a person when they die? And I've pictured here a body that is laid in the grave and in a, a few minutes, we are going to be heading to the cemetery. And Lorraine Larson's body is going to be laid in a grave. And you ask yourself, well, what happens then? And the answer is this, is that the spirit and soul of that person, and that spirit that was dead to God, and death means separation. When you came in this morning, we saw Lorraine. And we knew that that wasn't her. She is gone. She's died. The real Lorraine is separated from her body. And what we see here and what's in front of us is Lorraine's physical body. But Lorraine is gone. The Bible tells us to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. But if you don't know the Lord, the Bible tells us this, that your soul and spirit Go to a place of torment. And as we stop and we think of, of Lorraine, who did trust in Jesus Christ. And here's where the comfort comes in. This passage read, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And as we stop and we think of the word asleep, it's, it's an interesting word that the Apostle Paul uses. He didn't say die. He said asleep. And the reason he uses that word is because when a person falls asleep, they wake up. You might sleep a long time, but you're going to wake up. And there is going to be a wake-up day someday. And as we stop and we think of, of what happens to the soul and spirit of one who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior, as I just mentioned, the Apostle Paul said, to be absent from that body is to be present with the Lord. Where is Lorraine right now? She is not here. She is not here. Her temporary dwelling place that she lived in on this earth for 
91 and a half years. She's gone. And as we stop and we think, well, what happens now? And one of the questions that uh, the Apostle Paul is answering in this, in this passage is this. And in, and in the day that this was written, death was looked upon by people as the end. We bury a person, they are gone forever. And the Apostle Paul is saying, wait a minute. That isn't what happens. What happens is this, and let's read on. He reads on and he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And as we stop and we think of what's going to happen, the Bible speaks of the return of Jesus Christ. And at that return, those who are alive physically are going to be called up. But those who have, are asleep, who have died physically before this takes place. And Lorraine now fits that group of people. But the, the text said this. That there's going to be a resurrection. And she is going to be raised. And her soul and spirit are going to be reunited with a brand new body. The Bible tells us that this new body will not have aches and pains. That's good news. That this new body is, today it's corruptible, but tomorrow it's going to be incorruptible. And I'd like to read that particular passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, uh, beginning at the end of the chapter, in fact, the whole chapter is, is proving the resurrection. And he says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Jesus Christ is coming back. And we don't think about that very often. We often think that uh, everything is going to go on tomorrow, the next day, as it always has. But the Bible tells us that there is going to be an end of what we know today. Jesus Christ could come back today, tomorrow. He may wait a year or two. I don't think he's going to wait too many more years, but nonetheless, that's his business. What he tells us is this, I'm coming back, and I'm not going to tell you exactly when, but I want you to be ready for when I do come, because when I come, there's going to be a transformation that takes place that is, is literally unbelievable. He goes on and he says this, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice, the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means everlasting life. The Apostle Paul goes on and says this, for this corruptible, and the bodies that we live in right now, are corruptible. They are corrupt. They are going to break down. Things are going to go wrong. It's part of the curse. And as we stop and we think of this corruption, Paul says this, it must put on in corruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, 
and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And as we stop and we think of, of Lorraine, based on the word of God, if she believed, and this is exactly what the Apostle Paul said, if she trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross alone, and it's very important that we understand that as sinners, it was only what Christ did that could pay for our sin. Going to church, doing good things, they don't save you. We all come short. And it's very uh, easy for people just to assume that, well, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That isn't what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says this, only bad people go to heaven. In fact, the Bible says that's the only kind of people they are. If you are good here today and you are not a sinner, I would question, oh, I'm not talking to the chairs. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short. And the Bible says that there's only one work that can take care of the sin problem. And that is the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, just before he gave up his spirit, he cried out and he said, it is finished. You know what was finished? It means it was paid in full. And that means there are no sins remaining to be paid for by things like purgatory, things like baptism, things like doing good works. They just can't take care of sin. And you can make your list as long as you want. There's only one work. There is only one accomplishment that can take care of our sin. And that is what Jesus Christ did. And as we stop and we consider where Lorraine is, right now, that little dotted line right here, she's not, she's not out here yet. She's right in the middle. She's in the sleep stage physically, but her soul and spirit is in heaven waiting waiting for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, waiting for the time when, when Jesus Christ will leave heaven and call all of those who are, 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 have trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. She's waiting for that. And my question would be, are you waiting for that? And you see, if you haven't, trusted in Jesus Christ, you figure, you know, I'm a pretty good person. In fact, I like Lorraine, and she was a good person, and I try to be like her. Well, being like her might be nice for some of you, but she, she would have probably shook her head at that, okay, at that comment, but you understand what I'm saying. Being nice is not what gets a person to heaven. It's only Jesus Christ that gets a person to heaven. Well, you say, well, what happens to you if you don't? The Bible speaks of two destinations. And what's going to happen is this, is there's going to come a time when those who are unbelievers, those who, who have not believed, in Jesus Christ, they're going to be resurrected too. And that resurrection in their soul and spirit is going to be reunited. And I don't know what this is going to be like. And, I, and I'm glad I never will. And I hope you never will either. But the Bible speaks of two destinations. Heaven or hell. There's no middle ground. And there's no saying, well, I'm going to... Uh, just believe that there isn't a heaven and I don't really like to think about hell So I'm just going to believe that there is not a hell What you believe does not change reality the Reality is stated in God's Word and folks 
we need a source of truth. And it's what makes a, a message like this not so hard is that Lorraine knew where she was going. Did she want to go there? Did she want to die? I think she probably would have liked to hang around a little bit longer uh, here on this earth because there is a little bit of a fear of the unknown. But you know what? She wouldn't come back. She wouldn't come back. And we have something that's so great to look forward to, but it's only great if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, it's not so great. And so as I, uh, if you think of this, of this picture, uh, here's Lorraine. She's right here in the middle. We're going to take her body to the cemetery. And children, her body's not going to stay there. There's a day coming when her body is going to be raised. And in fact, the Apostle Paul goes on and he says this. He says in 1 Corinthians, he asked this question, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You see, the grave is not the final resting place. And right now, Lorraine is waiting for that new body that is going to happen. He goes on and he says this, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would just like to leave that, uh, leave that picture up. And as we stop and we think and remember Lorraine's life, and uh, I like that picture. And you can tell by looking in the face of Lorraine, there's a calmness there, isn't there? She was a pleasant lady. And family, you have good memories. She is pleasant, but she is also confident. She didn't want to put people out, but you know what? She realized this, that God loved her so much that he was willing to put himself out and send his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty that Lorraine, that you, that me, all of us together could never pay. And the Bible is so clear. It's so clear when we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, why did he die? To pay the penalty for sin. And his resurrection proves that God in heaven, his Father, was satisfied with the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. The question is, well, how do I know that uh, uh, Jesus' death paid for my sin? The answer is, he rose again. He rose again. Jesus Christ was not just another world religious leader. Jesus Christ was the very Son of God, the only one who could pay this penalty. And today we can sit here and we can sorrow. But I want to remind you that there is a hope in Jesus Christ. And Lorraine had that hope. And in fact, in, in just visiting last night, one of the uh, comments that was made by one of her son-in-laws was this. She made sure that all her children knew about Jesus. Is that true? And what he did for them. And when they got married, she made sure that all her son-in-laws knew about Jesus. 
And I think he didn't mention the grandkids, but is that true? It's true. And as we stop and we consider how important it is in grandparents and mothers that are here, the Apostle Paul said this to Timothy. He said, you had a grandmother and you had a mother that read you the scripture and taught you the scripture. And it was that scripture that made you wise unto salvation. Wow. What a legacy. What a legacy. And no matter how much material wealth Lorraine might have had or not had, you know, a million years from now, to have a family in heaven, it won't matter. The hardships on this earth just simply won't matter. Let's bow in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for Lorraine and her life. We thank you for the chance of, of meeting her and for her family here and for our paths crossing. And so we just pray that as we would remember her, that we would not just remember her as a nice grandmother, a good mother, a helpful person, an unassuming person, a friendly person, and a giving person, and a humorous person. But we pray that we would also remember her for someone who loved Jesus Christ and was fully convinced, was confident in what Jesus Christ did for her, was good enough. We thank you for her. We thank you for this time that we can come together to remember her. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you to stand together and sing one of her favorite hymns, He the Pearly Gates Will Open. So you can stand together.
on behalf of the family, I'd like to thank you for coming today and immediately following the service, there will be a procession that you're invited to join to the Cloverleaf Cemetery right close by and then we'll be coming back for lunch if you, uh, and you're more than welcome to join us for lunch. If you don't want to go to the cemetery and you're in a hurry, and you would like to stay and eat, the family says, go ahead and eat. And we'll be serving uh, along this side right here, and uh, we've got the round tables in the back reserved for the family. Uh, they'll be gone a, a, a few minutes, of course, and then, then come back. Um, and so there's uh, rooms here and here and here, and there'll be some more tables set up. If you don't want to go to the cemetery and just want to wait here, that would, uh, that, that would be fine. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn the service over to the uh, funeral director and for the uh, getting ready to go to the cemetery. Please rise.